Well, we're here at the 2017 PGA Merchandise Show, and we're fresh off the Forces in Motions workshop that was held recently in January in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, my name's Biv Wadden, and I was recently a student at the, uh, the recent workshop. I'm here today with Phil, Dr. Phil Cheatham, who is the senior sports technologist with the U.S. Olympic Committee and founder of SkilledMotion.com, and also Dr. Sasha McKenzie, who's a professor at St. Xavier University in Antigonish, Antig Antigonish? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't get it. Nova Scotia, <laughs> okay. Uh, welcome. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what you can expect uh, if you decide to move forward and, t and take this course. Uh, before they speak, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the value that I got out of uh, attending the most recent <coughs> uh, session in, in January. Um, I'm an instructor in the western uh, suburbs of Chicago, and I teach uh, uh, full-time. And, um, uh, you know, Phil and, Phil and Sasha have got a wonderful tag team, you know, uh, approach to teaching uh, forces and torques. and, and uh, I know, Phil, with your work, uh, one of the things that I took away from, from it, um, I've always been aware of the X-Factor stretch and the importance of, of kind of the, the, the stretch up here in the, in, you know, I call it a scapula stretch, yep, you call it okay. a you know, lead arm abduction. And then also the, the uh, stretch that it takes place you know, when the hands move the down wrist. and there's a com compression in the wrists. And uh, what I didn't know uh, was that the, uh, the 3D AM system can actually tease out those stretches and measure them. And so it was very interesting to me to uh, see you know, Phil's system be able to capture that kind of detail in a way that could uh, really, t you really identify whether or not a golfer was indeed doing those stretches or not and the, the magnitude of them. So I found that very helpful. And then with respect to Sasho's work that we're going to look at in a little bit, um, out of plane mo motion uh, is it, it, a very difficult topic intellectually. Um, um, I was uh, uh, helped through it in a way that I uh, came away you know, with a good strong understanding of it. And uh, I know there were golf swings in the past that I might have looked at and said, uh, something's not happening right in there, and I now uh, know better than to, to pathologize some of the movement that I used to. And um, um, I understand the the uh, uh, that it can be okay and and even welcome uh, in in spots. So yeah. um, with that, we're gonna uh, you know, Phil, why don't you give everybody a little idea of your your teachings in that. Well, as you can see, program. the idea of the workshop is what we call forces in motion. And in technical terms, that's kinematics and kinetics. And those are the foundations of biomechanics and biomechanics analysis. And so what I talked about, I talked about the kinematics part of it, which is the motion part of it. And the, the key parts of the motion that I like to talk about is the motion of the pelvis and the rib cage and the lead arm and the club and it kind of manifests itself in what we call the kinematic sequence. The kinematic sequence is very powerful. There's a lot of things that you can tease out of the kinematic sequence, as you talked about just a minute ago, the X-factor stretch, the shoulder stretch, and the wrist stretch. But let's, let's have a quick look at the kinematic sequence. And um, I've just got a picture there outlining um, the colors that we use in the graph that we display of the kinematic sequence. So you can see red is the pelvis turning motion. Green is the ribcage turning motion, <coughs> blue is the lead arm swinging motion, and yellow, or brown, depending on the, the slide, is the shaft swinging motion. And we put those together in a graph of those four curves right there, and the beauty of the kinematic sequence is it gives us the smoothness or the effective transition of energy all the way up the chain from the ground all the way through to the club itself. And so if you look at this graph here, you can see along the bottom is time in seconds, which is time through the swing. So this represents the whole swing. This first section here represents the backswing. The middle shaded section represents the downswing. And the, the third section there represents the follow through. On the vertical axis of the graph, we have 
rotation velocity, as I just mentioned. So I just explained that the red is the rotation or turning velocity of the pelvis. The green and, and one... These are degrees per second. Degrees per second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not miles per hour. Mm -hmm. It's degrees per second. Thanks, Bib. I'm glad you learned that from, learned the, something. from the workshop. <laughs> and so you can see that this part down here is negative. That's the backswing. And the positive part is the downswing. So the two key areas in this graph that really give us a lot of information of what we've just been talking about is this section here. That line represents the top of backswing. So the area around that line is the transition. And we find that people don't transition as all as one unit. You have the red one going first, the green one going second, the blue one going third, and the brown one fourth. And then, and I'll explain exactly what that means, alluding to what you said earlier in just a second. But then you see how these go up and down, up and down, just like a hill, a bigger hill, a mountain, and then a really peaky mountain with some jaggy curves on the other side. That's showing us how we get an acceleration and a deceleration of each part of the body, starting with the pelvis, transferring energy to the rib cage through the core, and then transferring energy to the blue arm, which would be the lead arm, through the shoulder, and then, of course, finally to the club shaft through the wrists. So each one of those key joints is really critical. But see, one critical point here, too, is you see an acceleration and deceleration. When the energy is transferred from one body part to the next, the acceleration and deceleration occurs kind of like cracking the whip. It sends the energy down the chain, down the system from the bigger, stronger muscles to the smaller, faster muscles. So what other, what other things can we read into this graph? What can we glean from this graph? Well, we can get what's called the x-factor stretch. From that graph, we can also see how in the downswing, in the transition, the lower body starts the motion first, tightens the core muscles, providing more energy. So from this graph, we can see an actual stretch there by seeing how that curve goes down. So this is the actual measure of the X factor, was the differential between your hips and your shoulders. And so at the top of backswing, we would have thought, oh, that's gonna be maximum because we want maximum X factor. But it's not. We actually get an increase because the hips go first, and so that curve goes down a little bit. But if we see an amateur doing it, we see it just goes straight up. So they're losing <coughs> all of this power at that point from the X factor and the stretch of the X factor. Now the interesting <coughs> thing we learned was that this situation goes on at all the joints. We see a loading, it's called the stretch shortened cycle of muscle. And when the muscle is loaded, it re reaches a higher tension level and can fire stronger, basically. And the X factor in and of itself really doesn't have much explanatory power for you well, know, creating... Well, it, it, it you know, stretches the yeah. muscles, no question yeah, about it. Yeah. I mean, a swing but like this, this, is, this will is, work. This is much more important as yeah, far as exactly. like, like the really down explaining swing stretch. The, you know, that marginal power in the And that explosion right. that you get at That's the right. top because right. now you've got that little right. extra stretch, right. loads it a little more, allows yeah. it to fire a little bit more strong. And strongly. I found as I was studying these graphs <laughs> that uh, it was real easy to kind of pick this out visually because all you need to do, you, you were looking for a decline in that line past the yeah. you know, top of the backswing versus this one go straight you know, up. going straight up. Yeah, that's that right. decline that's actually right. means that that angle is getting larger because that happens to be a negative yeah. number, so it might be going from 45 to 55. Right. And that's one of the things that we were helped with was, you know, as we're looking at these graphs, um, you know, it takes a little time to, you know, get, get your eyes, you know, used to them, but you pick up these little tricks that, uh, that we're taught to, you know, yeah, kind of Yeah, once you could relate it back up. to what's yeah. actually happening yeah. in the figure down here and, and some interesting yeah. tables. We see that, that uh, at the top of backswing it's 50, at pelvic transition it's 47, and then the maximum is 52. So in this case, the, the norms from our database, we get about a five degree extra stretch yeah. going on. I also got a lot of value from all of the, you know, tour, tour numbers. Your, your, your database of tour yeah. players and all the numbers throughout all of the, you know, like, like metrics, the, yep. you know, that was very valuable to have that data. Yeah, it gives you a, a good starting line, Correct. a good base. Correct. Correct. So then we found, like I said, we have the stretch at each joint. So we found the same thing happening at the shoulder, and we call it shoulder adduction because adduction means bringing the shoulder across and closing that gap like you see at the top of the backswing. 
So at the top of the backswing and in transition, we actually rotate the rib cage into the lead mm -hmm. arm. We don't just throw the lead arm away. Mm -hmm. And so it's very small, mm -hmm. it's only two or three degrees, but it's important. And we see that little down stretch right there as well. So we're getting compression of the shoulder and an increase going on. And that again, takes advantage of the stretch shorten cycle. This is something I actually teach, you know, Good. because people aren't in, they're not in touch with their, their scapula and their scapula protraction, which is, you know, it's, you know, yep. that's happening in addition to the adduction, yep. right? Yeah, and absolutely. You kind of got to get people in touch with that because uh, otherwise they're just wooden and they're working yeah. this way. So that this shoulder is, this complex is very, is, is very, very powerful. Very complex. <laughs> very complex and very powerful, <laughs> right. yeah. Right. So again, we can look at this, again, the same thing. If the curve just jumps straight up, then that's not going on. Now it's, it's small and it's very hard to see unless you're actually looking for it as you, you stated mm -hmm. there. And then finally, we're talking about now the lead wrist. A similar thing goes on here. We have what's called a downswing loading, a float loading, a wrist set action. There's a lot of different names for it. But basically what it means is at the top, the, the wrist actually stretches a little bit more. And that stretch allows you to release and sets up the release characteristics. Mm -hmm. Now this is just a single curve looking at the whole angle between the lead forearm and the shaft. We can break it down into actually flexion extension, ulnar radial deviation and pronation supination. I'm not gonna get into this in this talk, but there's slides on the website that talk about that a little bit more. But needless to say, there's many different styles of the way this works. You can actually do that downswing loading immediately from transition and pull it all the way into release. Or you can just come down with a, a fixed wrist set of one specific angle and then just milliseconds before release, you can downswing load it again, depending on who the golfer is and what type of swing, but they're all using that concept of the stretch shorten cycle to uh, get some more power. <clears throat> and now we get into the kinetics. <laughs> yeah, so the... Now get ready to have your brain a little stretched. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, we, we do have a nice little uh, yin and yang where Phil's presenting on the, the kinematics and I'm presenting on the kinetics and, and specifically what uh, causes the motion of the club which is a pretty complex topic and um, we, we do a, a pretty easy job filling up uh, half the Forces of Motion Conference just talking about how the golfer moves the club, which I think is the most important. There's the, the ground interaction, which is important, um, uh, but right now we're focusing on, on the club because that's what inevitably is going to hit the ball, right? Um, so what I thought I'd just touch on uh, to today in this, this little uh, promotional video is one of the concepts we talk about which is how the forces the golfer uh, applies to the club can influence its rotation and in particular um, how it can help the golfer potentially square the face for impact. So something that's kind of very, it's not intuitive to think how the motion of the club really early in the downswing can uh, and how you're applying forces early in the downswing can influence that, that, that club face clothing, closing in what seems like a completely different plane. Um, so if we take a look at, at an image here, I've got uh, Bubba halfway down in, in the downswing and if we could imagine what, what might be the direction of the force he's applying to the club. And we actually measure this uh, using the AMM system. So we have a nice little part of the workshop where Phil will, will um, uh, collect the kinematics and talk about the kinematics and then send me over the, the files uh, from a sensor that's on the club. And anyone who's got an AMM system or even other systems too, right? Can, can well, other systems moment, feed in? Or AMM just, and I think you've done it with a couple of others. Yep, uh, yep. Uh, the, the electromagnetic Gears? system, like the Plahima okay. system produces really okay. clean data that, that doesn't require mm, an right. expert user. Motion capture systems can be pretty tough. Uh, it can provide good data, but it, uh, the potential for errors may be a little bit higher. Okay. The uh, Polhemus electromagnetic data. And you'll learn about all the different <clears throat> 3D systems out there, you know, when you attend the workshop as well. That's right. So, so just to give a visual on, on how the force that the golfer is applying to the club can cause rotation, let's say that's, that's the force that Bubba is applying right now to the grip. Well, that center mass of the club, not only will that force linearly move the center mass, but it's actually going to try to cause the club to rotate. And in particular, it's going to produce a, a torque. If we watch that motion, I'll, I'll click and play it. So we're going to get that type of motion uh, of the club, that rotation, that kind of rotating from, say, below the plane to, a, to above the plane. 
But if you think about the fact that that club is attached to Bubba's lead arm, and that late in the downswing, Phil shows it in his system with the, 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 the supination, <coughs> the supination of the, the lead form that happens in every swing really fast and laid in the downswing, right? To, to help square the face. Well, this action of that club moving that way because the hands attached to the club is actually going to produce a torque that will promote supination. If you have that center mass of the club below that, that force vector, right? It's gonna actually help tip it up. If it's the other way, so if, that, if the person has an over the top uh, swing where the center mass of the club is above that, on the other side of that purple vector, that's actually gonna make it more challenging for that player to, to square the face. Um, and so I think a, a really good example of that is um, Sergio, right? So there's maybe a player who somebody might say, well, you know what, um, he grew up um, and that swing really works for him. It's not something that I would teach. He plays well despite his swing. But I look at it and I think, no, that, that feature of him laying off the, 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 the club uh, relative to that force vector he's applying is really helping him square the face, yeah. exactly. And I don't know if we're able to maybe hover and just press play in that, that video. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And so we'll be able to see, and I'm gonna take a guess uh, thanks, Russ. I'm going to take a guess where I'm going to draw a line and show where I think the force vector is being applied. So, um, and it's a pretty good, pretty good guess based on all the swings I've seen. So, he's going to get that center of mass quite a bit below. You're going to see that force vector pop on there. So that's actually now going to produce a torque that's going to help him close that off. Yes, Boom. supinate that lead forearm, and that face is going to slam shut. Okay. So I actually think that that what looks like for Sergio, that at a plane motion is actually, of the, of the club, can actually be a pretty helpful tool to square the face. Now, as, as you pointed out earlier, it's quite possible to have someone that doesn't look like they lay the shaft off. They might have a very steep looking shaft from a down the line view, but it's two things. It's not just about laying off the shaft. The shaft motion could stay looking really planar, but they can change what they're doing with their hands. So that force vector, which we can't see, can be changing. And, and that, that's, that's a, <clears throat> a torque ab about the shaft that you also you know, talk about in addition to the out of plane moments. That's right, right. that's right. So there's, there's two things. It's, it's the where's the center mass of the, 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 the club, you can manipulate that, mm -hmm. or you could manipulate that, how that force vector is being applied. Both of those could set up the conditions which could facilitate you squaring the club for, for impact. Um, and, and, and so, uh, there's a little slide showing the, the, the things that really go into that. You know, it's, the, it's the, the force that's being applied to the club, but also that moment arm. How close that, that force, the extension of that force that the golfer's applying to the grip passes to the center mass of the club. Um, and I just got a little video that I'll, that I'll show here. This is uh, an example of a graphical representation of where that center of mass is relative to the force vector. Um, so when that center of mass is below the force vector, that, that plane is actually going to turn yellow. And you can see this is a, this is a guy that's won a, a major championship. And, and you can see how long he's able to keep that center of mass below the force vector. This guy's using that as, as an advantage to help, help square the face. And then at, at some point late in the delivery, it needs to like get back above it, right? That's right. Just, just prior to impact? That's right. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go above that that. that plane that's created by the, mm -hmm. the, the force vector. Um, if you wouldn't mind playing that again, Russ, that'd be great. So what we can see is center mass is above the force vector when that plane changes. Now the center mass is below. It's below the force vector. It's below the force vector. So there's this, this, this torque, this angular impulse is acting on that lead arm. And then when it goes from yellow to gray, it's going back above. That's right. It right. goes back above. Right. Yep. Yeah. So what you'll see is that all the tour pros that I've looked at, they have that uh, positive hump on the graph showing that the center of mass gets below that force vector in, in, in early uh, transition. Mm -hmm. um, some do it more or, or, or less. Sergio would probably have a, a, a really big positive hump, um, but they all seem to do it, whereas the high handicappers um, do not. So that's something, and we get into some more detail in the, in the Forces Motion Workshop about the timing of that. Um, you know, when is it potentially good to be a player that has the club across the line at the top? versus someone like a Jason Duffner who has it laid off right at the start of the downswing. We, we explore all the, the different options in terms of timing. Uh, this. Great, great, great. 
Well, these are just a few of the many things that you learn if you attend the, uh, the two-day Forces in Motions workshop. And uh, I, for one, hope you seriously consider attending. I know I got a tremendous amount of, of value on it. And you're led by two of the top experts in the country in this area. And this, so, may I make a comment? If you like, you can actually do it online and get prepared that way, too. And the next one's coming beginning at February 27. Mm -hmm. And where? Where? It's online at okay. skilledmotion.com. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Biff.